Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode, I am going to discuss the National Lung Matrix Trial of Personalized Therapy in Lung Cancer, the new Nature paper that's out this week. You won't want to miss that. And then I'm joined via Zoom by Dr. Mark Friedberg, and we're going to be talking about the SPRINT trial. Yes, you may have forgotten about SPRINT, but Mark's going to explain why trial design is oh so important, and he's going to point out something that has been glossed over many, many times. So stay tuned. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. First up, the National Lung Matrix Trial of Personalized Therapy in Lung Cancer. This is the paper that appeared on July 15th in Nature. What do I want to say about this paper? Well, people who follow me on Twitter will know I spent a great deal of time with this paper because I tried to summarize it in a single slide, and I tweeted that out. Um, And that tweet has gotten 55 retweets and 100 and some odd likes, so maybe people find it interesting. I wanted to go through this paper to really see what it taught us about lung cancer. So first, you know, in in the plenary session discussion, maybe we should give you a little bit of background. Um, Imatinib in 1999 was a revolutionary drug. It targeted BCR ABL, which was the key oncogenic event in CML and the sole driver. And if you take Imatinib, the outcomes are tremendously beneficial. And that launched about... 10,000, 20,000, maybe 100,000 ships, and an age, a 20-year age of targeted therapy. And, you know, Tito Fojo put it nicely in one of his commentaries, which was, it was really two things came together. One, imatinib, which really, you know, was sort of a serendipitous event. You know, what are the odds that the first tyrosine kinase U drug happened to be the best tyrosine kinase 2 drug? You know, that's really sort of a random event. And, and, and that's how it lined up. Imagine if the first tyrosine kinase we drugged was IDH, IDH1. Um, then I think there would be very little enthusiasm for drugging tyrosine kinases because the benefit of that drug is incredibly marginal. Um, sure, it's well tolerated, but it doesn't appear to have durable remissions and it has a very modest increase in median survival. Uh, so, you know, I think it had to be a matinib. It had to be the first one that really sort of was an important arbitrary event in history that changed the direction of cancer research. And then the next thing Tito Fajo points out in one of his wonderful commentaries is the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project allowed us to sequence the genome cancer cells in widespread fashion. And when you put the two things together, an explosion of targeted drugs propelled by the first and luckily best Um, druggable target, and the ability to sequence tissue, you had the perfect storm for precision oncology. And of course, precision oncology is the idea that we are someday going to sequence people and come up with the perfect cocktail of drugs for that person. And it still looms so large in cancer medicine, it gobbles research budgets. It is an incredibly costly research enterprise because you have to sequence so many people. And many, many people who get sequenced pass away while they're waiting for the results. They pass away on first or second line therapy. They don't even make it to the point at which they get the experimental drugs, um, which is another fundamental limitation of the strategy. But the reason the strategy is so seductive is, I think, in part because of that arbitrary historical event that the first TKI we drugged was the best TKI we drugged. Um, And the ability to sequence tumors. That is what led to its popularity, more so than what it's actually done. And let me give you some evidence to suggest that. So the paper by John Markhart, um, Emerson Chen, and I in JAMA Oncology in 2018 was a very sober appraisal of this idea, this strategy. We went through you know, all of the drug approvals since 
2000, and we asked, let's pull out every single approval where you test for a genomic alteration, and if you find said alteration, you give said drug, such as BRAF V600 in melanoma, such as ALK rearrangements in non-small cell lung cancer, you get the picture. And then we looked through the population of people who'd present with advanced or metastatic cancer, the people who would die this year if left untreated, and we asked, how many of these people are eligible for genome-targeted drugs? And that's a product of two things. It's a product of the tissues in which the druggable alterations appear and the frequency with which the druggable alteration occurs in that tissue. Um, and then we also assume that let's say we can test everybody and let's say there's no attrition, nobody dies before they get therapy, and let's say the therapy is free and everyone can get it. And we looked at this across the entire landscape in 2018, and the super sober finding was, you know, about 8.5%, 9% of people would be eligible for these drugs, best case scenario, and maybe about 4% of people would be responders. And if you contrast that, as we have done in subsequent publications with a checkpoint inhibitor class of medication, with cytotoxic drugs, you find that it is really lagging. Checkpoint inhibitors, just, just ipilimumab and nivolumab, just PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4, just those two targets, um, you know, that came onto the scene in 2011, had very small market share for a couple of years, just melanoma, then boom, the approvals in non-small cell lung cancer um, based on the PD-L1 uh, cutoffs, uh, well, initially in the second line, and then later based on the PD-L1 cutoffs in the frontline setting, um, then small cell lung cancer, a number of other cancers, it's already claiming 43% of patients, you know, um, at least four or five times as much as genome therapy, despite the fact that it's far newer. It's got one less decade under its belt. Um, the cumulative number of responders is probably about 15%, which is actually probably um, first foreshadowed in the original phase one study. Um, but it's a significant response rate uh, collectively from this new class of agents. And cytotoxic drugs, of course, crush everything. You know, they have 80, 85% market share. Um, they have responses 30 percentage points or higher uh, cumulative response rates across all, all tumor types. So what's the point here? The point here is that, you know, it's exciting. It's seductive to think you can sequence tumors and give the right drug for the right person on the right day. Um, but it is a strategy that has been disappointing, and it's been outpaced by checkpoint inhibition, which was a strategy, ironically, in the early 2000s that was laughed at. People thought was foolish and misguided, um, but it turned out to easily eclipse genome therapy. And so we've done some work since then that is hitherto unpublished, but we hope to publish it, which, you know, I believe will make the compelling case that we are at a rate limiting step and the rate limiting step is biology. We're going to continue to find new genome targets. We're going to find the TREX. We're going to find the RETS. We're going to find targets that it's important to drug and that you get good responses when you drug. And maybe a fraction of those, you actually improve survival quality of life, maybe a high fraction. But those are going to continue to unfold themselves at about half a percentage point or one percentage point per year of all cancer patients. So we're at nine now. We're probably actually in 2020, maybe we're about 10. And, you know, 10 years from now, I think we'll probably be a little bit below 20. I mean, we're not going to get to 100% um, in in the near future. It's, it's just not going to happen. But I think the second piece of the puzzle here is that this kind of sober analysis of what we have accomplished, um, given the tremendous outpouring of resources, is something that rubs many people the wrong way for a couple of reasons. One, there are a number of ways in which you can make money in a precision oncology strategy because one, you can be the vendor of the test. Two, you can be the vendor of the drug. Three, you can be the vendor of an algorithm that would pair the test with the drug. You can be the... The moment that there's a test involved, you can be the person who figures out the better way to get the sample. Can it be blood-based? Does it have to be tumor biopsy-based? Are there better ways to get that um, tissue, get the data? So there's a number of places in which you can profit from this strategy. Then there's the next thing, the, the under-discussed point as to why this really took off, which is, you know, if you have colon cancer, if you have breast cancer, if you have lung cancer, you always have choices in the American marketplace. Now, this is something that you know people in Europe might not fully appreciate, but in the U.S., we have a lot of choices where we'll get our cancer care, and our cancer care is very lucrative. Let's say you lived in the suburbs of Portland. You live in Hillsborough. You can get cancer care at a number of places. You can get cancer care at Compass Oncology. You can get cancer care maybe at the Kaiser System. You can go to Providence out west, or you can go all the way to OHSU downtown. Why would you go to OHSU downtown? Well, 
you would go there if you believe that they're able to do something for you that you can't get done closer to home. And I think one of the great challenges here in the American marketplace, which has really sort of set the the tenor on this issue, is that these big referral centers have a difficult time of growing their patient population because many people live far away and who wants to get chemotherapy and then sit in a car for an hour and a half or two hours to go home? That I couldn't think of anything worse than that. I just wanna be home instantly. I wanna be five minute drive away from where I get chemo or get my treatment. And that's a restriction. And so the ways in which these centers have tried to compensate is one, they're buying up other hospitals and they have a you know, Cleveland Clinic outpost every every four, 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 four miles. They have outposts across New Jersey for Sloan Kettering. So they, they're buying all these outpost sites. The other way they, they have compensated is they have to come up with, this is gonna hurt a little bit, but gimmicks to try to draw people into the major center. And one of those gimmicks is the robot will do the surgery. You're not gonna get a surgeon surgery done by a surgeon. You're gonna get it done by a robot. And who's gonna control the robot? A cyborg. No, it's not gonna be a cyborg. No, it'll be, it'll be a person controlling the robot, but you get my point. They gotta think of these gimmicks. And is the robot better than the actual person doing the surgery? Mm, well, that's, we don't need to worry about that. And in oncology, one of the major things that these centers could have offered is the genome sequencing. We're gonna sequence a tumor and we're gonna give you the right drug, the right strategy for you, for your tumor. And that, I think, coupled with the reduction in price, coupled with the availability of many off-label drugs, coupled with the environment in the US that's very lax on off-label drug use, coupled with the need to get business to the big centers from this community to keep growing. Because if you're not growing, you're not, you're not winning in this modern world. Um, and so, so these factors coalesce to create the perfect storm for overstated claims in precision oncology. And I think that's what people don't realize. And then if you ask yourself, well, why does this affect other global nations? Well, you know, to some degree, and this is also going to hurt, but many nations follow the lead of the United States. And if perverse financial incentives in the U.S. set the research agenda perversely, that will be adopted by many nations around the world, even in the absence of those perverse incentives. That's what I think is sort of a double whammy here. So I don't know. These are sort of some of the broader sociologic thinking around precision oncology. And the reason I even think about all this stuff is that I wonder why more people don't look at these trials as just as strikingly negative as they are. So let's turn to the current paper, which is, you know, just strikingly negative, the National Lung Matrix Trial of Personalized Therapy in Lung Cancer. These are good people doing good work. So I want to say that right off the bat. This is a good effort. And they're taking a lot of people with non-small cell lung cancer. They're doing genomic sequencing. They are potentially matching them to one of 22 single arm studies, um, looking at eight different drugs. And here they report out 19 arms of this trial. Um, one of the things that I think that they make a mistake on is they use a Bayesian adaptive design. Now, that's not a mistake necessarily, but their Bayesian adaptive design has go, no go rules over three endpoints, disease control rate, response rate, and progression free survival. Now, how can I put it? If you're in cancer medicine and you're running an uncontrolled clinical study and you want to know, is there signal here to proceed? That's your question. Well, one of the challenges you face is that you might not have picked a representative sample. Your sample's not representative in a few ways. One, in this, in this study, um, you have to exhaust proven treatment options or decline proven treatment options to enroll on this study. So already you're weeding out people who die on first line therapy, die on second line therapy, or um, die soon after and don't make it. Um, they're not fit enough to enter into your study. So you're weeding out a lot of aggressive biology. Um, you also have this unique filter. You're selecting for the kinds of people who would decline um, some of these therapeutic options. The next thing you're doing here is you have a molecular filter. You're filtering people who have a unique molecular alteration. Do the people who have a NRAS mutation live the same as just an average non-small cell lung cancer? Do they live the same as somebody with a RET rearrangement? I think I've shown you in some data by Alex Drillin in a prior paper that if you give pemetrexid to people with different mutations, they have different progression-free survival durations. Pemetrexid works better in RET rearrangements than it works in RAS mutation, for instance. So you're adding in a couple of filters, this unique filter of who's entering your study and the filter of a genomic filter. And the net result is, well, if the patient takes a drug and they have stable disease for four months, is that good? Is that bad? Well, what would their stable disease be without the drug? It certainly wouldn't be zero months. You know, it takes some time to be 120% tumor growth. And thus, you can start to see the challenge here. Disease control rate, progression-free survival, 
are absolutely worthless endpoints in an uncontrolled study where you've inserted many selection filters to create a population in which you don't know what the natural history of tumor growth is. Progression-free survival might be seven months because just because their tumors take seven months to grow 120%. It might be different than all comers because who knows what happens when you put all these hurdles to jump through? Who can jump over all these hurdles and be on the other side? What is their natural history? What is the counterfactual here? We don't know. So that's the beauty of response rate. You know, as much as I beat up on response rate, it has a logic, which is if a drug is capable of shrinking a tumor, surely that is something that wouldn't have occurred in the counterfactual. See, I think philosophically, the huge error cancer doctors have made is they think response rate means efficacy. No. Response rate means activity. It means a drug has promise that you should consider it for a trial of efficacy. But efficacy is living longer or living better. We came up with response rate because we wanted to prune down the list of drugs to test in efficacy studies. That's why we developed a response rate. You know, in the seminal paper by Charles Mortel, you might not know this story, there's an ingredient in peach pits called Waitro or amygdalin. And this is a drug that a lot of quacks thought would benefit cancer patients. And Charles Mortel in the Mayo Clinic was like, this drug isn't doing anything. But how can I convince people? Did Charles Mortel do a randomized control trial of Latril, no Latril, and show no improvement in overall survival? No, he didn't. Charles Mortel just gave Latril to, I believe, 190 consecutive patients. And when only one of them had a response, Charles Mortel said, look, this drug has no activity. It doesn't shrink cancer. It's unlikely to improve survival. It's not even worth testing. And ergo, this is a quack medicine. And that's what killed that whole industry. That's what killed that whole latral movement was that Charles Mortel study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Response rate had been used in that fashion for years. If you don't use response rate, how many phase three trials can you run in oncology? The answer is infinite. You can run infinite trials. You can test Miralax. You can test Aquaphor. You can test glue. You can test a glass of brandy. You can test a handful of peanuts. You can test anything you want because anything could be tested in a phase three trial. Who knows? It might work. In fact, if you test enough of them, many of them will be positive with the uh, nominal p-value cutoffs that we use um, by chance alone. And that's a theme I explore in Malignant. So response rate was developed because we needed a way to prioritize what to test. The reason I say all this is that this trial is, is fine to use a Bayesian adaptive design but they should not have included disease control rate and PFS. The design should be adapted to response rate. It should just all be go, no, go. If a drug has no response, it's a no go. Now they say here, they chose PFS disease control rate or response rate based on the quote, expected mode of action. So I think the idea is that they think some of these drugs in inhibit growth, even though they don't cause cell death. Um, and I think that that is, you know, something that people can talk about. But the truth is, it doesn't bear out in empirical studies. I mean, it's a laboratory concept. But the empirical truth is that drugs that actually do lack single agent activity generally have absolutely no improvements in survival. They are almost all fail. A handful succeed despite the odds. And the handful is so small, you might wonder if they're succeeding just by fluke p-values and all that. But in that handful that succeeds, the median improvement in survival is 1.4 months. This is a paper that Bishal and I did in, in Nature Reviews a paper on drugs that lack single agent activity. So what's my point here? My point here is that it really is the case that drugs that are really good and transformative drugs, they do have single agent activity. Drugs that don't have single agent activity, like probably 999 out of 1,000 really don't work. Maybe one in 1,000. To be honest, I'm probably missing a few nines. Um, most of those drugs don't work. And so I think in this design, they could have improved it by having just some response rate cutoff. The cutoff they propose of 30%, that's quite reasonable, and using that for a go, no-go decision. And in fact, of the eight arms that are still open, if they used a response rate cutoff, I bet several of those would be closed, and, and this trial would be really wrapping right up. So anyway, I don't want to go into too much extraneous things here just to say they sequenced lots of people, thousands of people. Many of them had a match that would make them putative. But at the end of the day, they were only able to drug 302 people for all those reasons I mentioned that people died on prior lines of therapy that didn't make it this long. Um, and that speaks to the fact that 
you know, these trials have a lot of attrition. Maybe an easier way to have done this trial would be, let's just sequence people at the point at which we want to enroll them on the study and actually randomize that part. That's what I would have done. Um, but, you know, this is this is fine. Um, and they get their 19 arms and they have a nice table of what the 19 arms and the drugs they give, the FGFR inhibitor, um, palbocyclib, crizotinib, selumetinib, plus docetaxel. You know, they got their, their drugs. So, you know, the first thing I did when I looked at this was I just want to know the response rate arm by arm. And it actually wasn't very easy to get because they report the Bayesian response rate and that confused me. I was just one. I'm a dumb doc. I just want numerators, denominators. So I went through the manuscript and it's reported in, in, in an interesting grouping and it's kind of tricky for me to read. So I finally, after like reading it for like an hour, two hours, I finally built this slide where I could answer it in all the cohorts. So let me just take you through what we found in this study. So the first thing they find right off the bat is that a couple of the arms of their study were kind of scooped. Ross 1 and Krizotinib. Well, that got approved, um, you know, as the study was running. Um, EGFR T790M and Osimertinib, you know, sorry, that's 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 the known entity. Um, Dervalumab, the PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, yeah, that's also, you know, well known. We know the role of PD-1 and pd one inhibitions in lung cancer. Um, you know, two arms were excluded because of less than three people. This is arm E1 and E3, the NRAS mutation and the LUSC NF1 loss mutation. Um, one was abandoned. Uh, the RET inhibitor was abandoned uh, early on. So, so these are sort of the first few things to note. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six arms really are going to be not informative because they're abandoned, they're too small, um, or they're already approved. They're just really not going to be informative from this study. The next thing I found, you know, the selumetinib arm, um, this was the NF1 law selumetinib docetaxel arm. They find a 29% response rate, 4 out of 14. And it turns out that that's probably below the 40% response rate that they had for combination arms. So probably that, that arm should be abandoned. But um, uh, the point here is that it's really kind of a useless arm because you're giving docetaxel. Docetaxel is going to have some response rate. Is the response rate of docetaxel going to be different in people with this very particular um, mutation? And the answer is, yeah, it might. Who knows? Um, so I think that this arm, I call it useless because there's a confounding drug given. But, you know, many of you know that selumetinib has a super interesting history that is described in Malignant, um, where they're very promising phase two results of selumetinib plus docetaxel in an underpowered phase two trial. And that was not recapitulated in the phase three trial where selumetinib docetaxel against placebo docetaxel in lung cancer failed miserably. So anyway, so I'm going to put that selumetinib arm um, in the probably not very useful information pile. The other two selumetinib arms are, of course, excluded because they had to too few participants. Um, one drug mutation pairing caught my eye. This was actually quite interesting. This was MET exon 14. Um, this is CMET exon 14 mutations, of which we actually have a recently approved drug. And here they find crizotinib um, has an 8 out of 12 or 75% response rate. And I put this in green. Like, this is interesting. This is interesting to me. Um, so, yeah, one arm. Interesting. Okay, let's go further. The AKT inhibitor, which was tested in four arms, zero out of 28 people responding. I call that abject failure. Um, and then all of the other arms were total failure. Um, the FGFR inhibitor had one out of five uh, patients responding, 20% response rate, but it's too small to really say 20%. They say the cohort was closed. So actually, that's really not useful information. I don't know anything about, I don't know sufficiently about that FGFR inhibitor. And I'm very curious why the cohort was, cohort was closed. The statement was that the drug wasn't available. I, I really want to know more. Um, I, I hope it was not made unavailable for other data that's not being disclosed. Um, the TSC1, TSC2 mutations, uh, again, 0 out of 5, 0% response rate. Uh, the STK11 loss, 0% response rate, 0 out of 17. Um, the KRAS um, mutation, STK1 loss, that combo, uh, B2D cohort, 8% response rate, which I consider failure, less than 10% in my mind is just failure. Um, palbocyclib in the first four cohorts, 1% response rate, 1 out of 69 patients, abject failure. Um, you know, once you start to get to one, 2% response rate, that's what we see in placebo arms of clinical trials because of measurement error. Um, the KRAS mutations, 0% uh, response rate, um, I think 0 out of 42 and 0 out of 13, which are failure. Um, and that's it. That's the whole paper. 
So when I look at this paper and I mark it up, and you can look at my slide online and hopefully we'll add it to the email link, um, you see of the 19 arms, one is kind of interesting. One is kind of really not very useful because you're combining selimentin with docetaxel, and we already have a lot of data on that. We have a phase three there. Um, and that's kind of a confounding thing, so I don't know what to do with the response rate. Um, and the rest are, are not really useful information, either because it was approved already based on response rate, not because, of course, God forbid we want to know if the drug makes people live longer or better. Not that, but of course, there's a response rate. Um, or it was closed um, for few participants or abandoned. So, you know, what's my takeaway from this study? I mean, I, I do think the investigators did a good job. This is really useful information. Um you know, one of the things somebody said online, which got me was, um, but it got me because I think it's just sort of a, a, a flawed way of thinking. This person said, like, this actually shows that even though we don't have good drugs, like these drugs don't work, the strategy is sound because 2,000 people out of 3,000 people had one of these mutations. So if we could just come up with the right drugs, like we could sequence everyone and drug the right and drug these mutations. And I want to say that that's not a good takeaway message. That's a very flawed takeaway message because why did they pick these mutations to include, like why did 2,000 people have mutations that were druggable? Well, it's because we had these drugs. And what if you took any mutation where we have a drug or don't have a drug? And the answer is probably, my guess is every single person with cancer has some mutation in their, in their tumor for which we have or don't have a drug. I'm not aware if there's any, if some biologist knows, is there anybody who ever had cancer that did, that had the, the, the DNA matched the germline DNA 100%? There's not a single mutation in there. I don't think that that's the case. There's always some mutations. And if your argument is that all we need are drugs that work, well, then that applies to everything. Pancreas cancer, yeah, if we had drugs that drugged all these mutations, if we had a drug that overcame P53 loss, that would be great. Yeah, but we don't have that drug. These are the drugs we have, and that's why these mutations were picked, and these drugs all failed. And I think the conclusion is not that we need better drugs, because that's sort of like a, a fantasy. Like, yeah, we need better drugs, we need a magic wand that will rid ourselves of cancer. Sure, yeah, but that's not going to happen. The question is, is this a useful strategy? And what this suggests is that even with the best preclinical science of these 19 arms, the majority are abject failure. They don't work. And what I think that means is that drugging some mutations in very complex tumors is really unlikely to significantly bend the curve in cancer. You're going to continue to find diseases like salivary gland cancer and infantile dermatosarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma, where TREC rearrangements are profoundly important. You're going to keep finding those. But if you want to really bend statistics for people with cancer, improve outcomes in colon, lung, breast, ovarian, and prostate, the idea that you're going to be able to keep sequencing and drug the right mutations and come up with the right cocktails, that's probably not going to work. Because in this study, most of these arms were actually uninformative. Anyway, but that's not going to stop anyone. They're going to continue to throw, I mean, I guess I think that if you really were to stand back and look at these data and look at the slide, your conclusion would be, wow, that's a very negative study. You've got maybe one little bit of a signal in um, exon 14 skipping met um, alterations, but you already have a drug there. So you know that that might actually be like a, a useful target. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of negative arms. Um there was a guy named Jim Allison who in the early 2000s people thought was, you know, not very bright and wasting his time. And then by 2011, he had a drug with a modest benefit in one cancer. And then by 2020, um, the class of medications, checkpoint inhibitors, have um, done maybe four or five times as, as much good um, as um, the genome targeted drugs. Uh, okay. So I guess what I mean, I take as the lesson is that it's, it's very likely a very fundamentally different way of thinking about cancer might be, might be worth funding than continuing to crack on with the idea that it's just a matter of sequencing and finding the right mutations and giving the right drugs. I think it is that to some degree, particularly for rare histologies and rare tumor types, but it's unlikely to be that for, for common cancers, which are really complex genomic events. And, and and, and cancer is not just a genomic event. I think that's another fallacy. Cancer is a complex biological interaction where some types of cells in the body threaten the host. And of course, there's some genomic instability that's almost prerequisite to that. There's likely also some immune surveillance 
problem there too. And there's likely some other stuff that is really sort of poorly characterized, poorly defined. Um, I don't want to say some of those buzzwords, so I'm not going to say them, but there's likely a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And the idea that you're just going to come up with some magic signature, genomic signature, and the right drug for that, I think is is really sort of not been borne out um, by time. Uh, it's not been borne out by by certainly by, by this paper, which is really disappointing. When we finally see the NCI match, not just the arms that they've chosen to report, but all of the arms, and we look at it, my guess is it's going to be quite comparable to this result. It's going to be quite negative. Um, and I think what it really suggests is that of the huge amount of research and philanthropic money that goes into this, um, that money should be diverted to something else. I mean, let's just, I can't control the research funding. The research funding is going to be tied up in a quagmire, but let's talk about the philanthropy. If you're a philanthropist and you want to invest in cancer research, don't fund immunotherapy and don't fund precision oncology. That's being funded. What do you want to fund that for? Fund something. The whole point of philanthropic giving in the cancer drug space is to, um, to take gambles society won't take, to be the high-risk investor. The same things that lead philanthropists to make their money in the first place a ability to tolerate risk and an appetite for taking chances. The moment they become philanthropists, it's always the, the most tried and true putting your money where everyone else puts their money. What sense does that make? If you're a philanthropist, don't fund sequencing and don't fund immunotherapy now that has sufficient funding. Fund something different. Take a gamble. That's what philanthropic money can do. It should be a compliment to public purse. The public money, I think, there needs to be better benchmarks of accountability and better logic to how it's apportioned. Um, but that unfortunately is going to be tied up and so much of it is going to be driven by, you know, group think and wishful thinking and those kinds of things. That's harder to break, but certainly the philanthropic side, I just don't baffles me. Um, but I do think that we can't understate sort of what the complex role he, that's going on here, which is that the first targeted drug, TKI drug, at least some people think, Tamoxifen is a targeted drug. God, God help us. Uh, they might as well think taxanes are a targeted drug. They're potent microtubule inhibitors. But anyway, let's just let's talk about targeted drugs as they actually mean um, colloquially, uh, such as TKIs. The the, be the first targeted drug was the best targeted drug. That's not because of science. That was just a total lucky break. That was just total luck that the first was the best, and that launched so many other people pursuing targeted drugs. And that led to by the end of 2010, by the end of 2015, by 2020, many, many, many targeted drugs and many, many more on shelves and companies. They've got tens of thousands of targeted drugs. And then we have the genome sequencing that happened hand in hand, happened to be in the same era. And now we have so many targets. And then we have these computational approaches. And then we had the fundamental problem of how do big centers steal business from the community? And they can't do it based on convenience. And they probably can't do it based on quality. And they probably can't do it based on outcomes. They haven't looked into that. But I suspect that when you're getting full fox into the community doctor with the type of practices we have, you're probably going to get as good an outcome as when you get into the big center. They can't compete on those. The only thing they can compete on is offering you a service that they just don't offer there. And genomics and molecular tumor boards, that's the best service because you got a people in your shop who already have those skills and you can just bring them in there and then you can sell the audience, the market on this. And then because you've done that, you don't even realize you've sold your philanthropy on that. You've got a huge philanthropic support for that, even though it's redundant and really just a drop in the bucket compared to federal funding. Um, you've got your your business agenda oriented that way. You've got a huge vested interest in this, um, that it's so easy to always see the glass half full, even when the glass is one out of 19 full. Um, it's so easy to be vehement that this is promising um, when all available data suggests that it is not that promising. It's probably horrendously overfunded and it's probably not going to be uh, the way forward. And um, in 25 years from now, uh, we're not going to sequence everyone's tumor. We're not going to come up with an individual cocktail for them. We're probably going to have a couple of classes of medications that make huge dents in cancer. We don't even talk about now or we we dismiss. Um, we're probably going to have a continued growth in genome sequencing, about 1% per year, um, in line with historical growth over all this time. Um, and, and that's it. And we're probably, and that growth is going to be disproportionately in rarer tumors, as we showed in, in the paper by Antonio Sazim um, on, um, on basket trials. So, you know, those are just some thoughts, you know, good work, good investigators, um, really a disappointing paper. Um, a challenge for me to kind of pull out those response rates because I think they could have been presented just in a simple table. Um, 
but you know, just an all around, all around negative study. All right. Um, on that positive note, we're going to turn to the next discussion. In this next segment, a little fun segment that I didn't advertise, I just want to highlight some tweets that I've put out over the last week or two weeks and, and rant about them a little bit. So that's what, that's what my goal is here. So here's one. The easiest thing is to tweet a message that folks who already agree with you will retweet and like. The hardest thing is to generate writing, podcast, videos, research, or other content that actually changes the opinions, persuade folks who truly disagree. Boy, I really believe this. Gosh, you know, every day I go on Twitter, I really wonder, like, why should I just delete this stupid, insipid account? Because it is just a sea of tweeting things that are going to appeal to people who already agree. I mean, I'll just take one example. When the USPSTF has issued draft guidance suggesting that we're going to lower the lower bound age of the recommendation, the B recommendation for lung cancer screening from 55 to 50. All of the usual suspects liked it and retweeted it and praised it and celebrated it. But it's not persuading anyone who was skeptical of the strategy. It's not persuading anybody to continually assert that it saves lives. And then, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to think of the way in which you could show somebody the error. And and in that case, I had a nice little figure I keep showing, which shows that whatever gain you think you're getting in lung cancer death is more than offset by non-lung cancer death. And the all-cause death, if anything, it's numerically higher in the intervention arm than the control arm. And it's not great. It's the same in both arms. And it's high, it's significant on the course of a few years. So if you really want to benefit people at risk of lung cancer, a strategy has yet to prove that all-cause mortality is the way we measure that. You don't know if you're simply trading death, you're miscoding death, the downstream deaths from the intervention cascade you spark, offset whatever benefit you get. You don't know any of that. Um, and yet, you know, people are happy to retweet about that. The truth is right now, there are strong feelings about when and how, under what circumstances, with what stopping rules schools should open. I just don't understand how anyone thinks that you can answer that question in one tweet. In fact, I don't know how anyone thinks that they can even answer that in their own mind. If you really tasked me with answering this question, I would have to commission a team of like 12 really bright people with background in education, economics, sociology, long-term wealth. I'm going to want somebody like a Raj Chetty at the table. I'm going to have to bring people with public health expertise, people who understand domestic violence, child abuse, sociology. I'm going to have to bring all these people at the table. We're going to have to meet, hear all these opinions, learn all these things I didn't know, create a very complex risk-benefit calculus, ask whether and to what degree children spread the virus, how it'll affect the system, what we're doing to children if we keep them at home, what kind of gaps we're exacerbating. Um, So I need disparity researchers at the table. I just need a lot of people at the table. I'm going to commission a white paper on this. We're likely to have dueling factions. I might have a red team to to, to write the paper opposing our team. I mean, I would spend so much effort, so much effort would go into the idea of just trying to articulate, let's make sure we know all the unknowns. At least there'll be known unknowns and not unknown unknowns. And even then, I think I would struggle to make the final call. I might allow for some experimentation to occur on the margin. I might create different stopping rules in different localities. It will have to take into account local spread. Okay, so all these things would go into this huge complex calculus. This is not easy. And yet on Twitter, people fall so strongly into camps that unless the virus is extinguished, you can't do any school at all in person or the school has to happen no matter what happens with the virus. I mean, it's just, just ludicrous that, that, <laughs> that anyone would have a strong conclusion on a matter that is deeply technical and very, very hard that somebody who has literally read nothing on the topic would have a strong idea. It just blows me away. Anyway, 
I do think there's just too much preaching to the choir, and, and that's really what drives polarization and divides. And the more you do that, you just take an issue that you just you kill discussion. I mean, the simple one I think is is masks. Um, you know, we tried in the last episode to have a really thoughtful discussion on it. The more I survey the landscape, I come to the conclusion that there is not a single person left in America who's undecided on this issue. People either believe in it and will do it, or they don't believe in it and they won't do it. And you're not going to change anyone's mind. And you can have mandates, but you'll have to decide how you want to enforce those mandates. Are you going to be imprisoning people, ticketing people? And you got to decide if the downstream effects of your of your mandate and your policy is, is going to bite you in the ass. Are you going to actually tip a political election in a different direction if you're too strict in your mandate? Are you going to get people who disagree with you now want to flaunt your authority or push you? What are you going to do with people if they don't comply? I mean, it's 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 a disaster. Um, and yet, you know, it doesn't stop people from just tweeting their polarized opinion. And it's not helping anybody. It's not actually changing anyone's mind. Anyway, so that, that issue, I think, is just done. Let me give you another tweet. Here's one. If you're researching how to improve cancer screening, here's a pro tip. Just hit find and replace. Find, detect cancer, replace with, improve survival, and rethink the paper if it no longer makes sense. Gosh, you know, each week, and this was no no different, somebody sent me an article that somebody's working on, a working paper, and it was all about how if we changed cutoffs for screening in one way or the other, um, we're going to be able to increase the rate at which we find cancer. And I was like, you know, if somebody wants to work in the space of cancer screening, they should at least do some basic reading and educate themselves and learn a few things. Finding cancer is not the goal of cancer screening, okay? You might find less cancer and make it better. You might find more cancer and make it worse. You don't know. The goal is there are turtles, rabbits, and birds. If you find birds, you've done yourself no good. They're going to fly out of the yard anyway. They're likely already micrometastatic at presentation. If you find turtles, whether or not you find them or not, they're not going to get out of the barnyard. They're not going to cause a problem. They're not going to be lost. Those those are the, the indolent cancers that can be overdiagnosed. In the middle, you have the rabbits, and cancer screening is trying to find the rabbits, the ones that were going to hop out had it not been for the fence. This is a great analogy that actually nobody knows who came up with. But anyway, the reason I say that is... People come into this space and they do papers, really complex modeling papers, spending tons of brain power, and they're just concerned with optimizing finding cancer. They have no clue what cancers they're finding. They are wasting their effort and they're displaying, I believe, arrogance and ignorance to walk into a field you know nothing about and not to even read about it and read the different points of views and then think you can improve upon things is just staggeringly arrogant to me. And so I read this paper and I just thought to myself, a string, first of all, I thought just nothing but expletives in my mind when I was like, this, these people don't know what they're doing. And then I was like, but why are good, good, smart people wasting their lives on something they don't even understand um, and setting the bar so low just to show that they can innovate and de- demonstrate something new? Anyway, it baffles me. So that, that was my, my tweet there. Oh, here was one, one that blew me away. Somebody just posted that, uh, and health insurer had like massive profits. Um, and uh, this is so bad that these health insurers are making all this money. And then I said this, an underappreciated idea is that insurers are not actually incentivized to cut costs. So this is what something that very people, a few people understand. Since the Affordable Care Act, the medical loss ratio caps profit as percent of revenue. If you get 20% of a pizza, what size pizza should I order? See, insurers are actually incentivized to grow healthcare just slowly and predictably. Sudden year-to-year unpredictability and costs rising more rapidly than competitors is an issue, but fundamentally a bigger pizza means their slice is bigger. The most misunderstood incentive is that there is no downward market pressure in the U.S. Disaster is coming. See, this is something that is the most misunderstood concept about insurance companies. The Affordable Care Act limits the profit as percentage of revenue the medical loss ratio that flows through a company. They have to spend a certain fraction. They have to spend 80%. They can only keep 20%. The moment you restrict someone's profit to a percentage, to a percentage, you have fundamentally changed their incentive structure. We are telling insurers that you're only going to be able to keep 20% of the money that flows through the healthcare system as your profit. So how do they improve their profit? They can't do it by being leaner. 
They can't do it by cutting things that don't work past that point. They can only get the 20%. Once they get their 20%, they get to that sweet, lean, engineered 20%. Then the only way they can grow their profit is to grow healthcare spending. You have removed their bite from the marketplace. They don't really have an incentive to lower long-term growth, long-term growth on the orders of decades. If society spends 50% of GDP on healthcare, they will not really care in the long run. They will still get their 20%. It'll be a bigger 20%. We have cut them deeply with this. We have created a system where there is no true downward pressure. So insurers can do a lot of things to make people's lives annoying and not cover some drugs and not cover others. And they're doing that in part because they want to streamline the the predictability of the market. They want it to be predictable. Um, they they know that some of those actions in, su- in itself serve as a deterrent from certain types of certain types of of utilization. Um, They may wish to have some short-term stability so that they can be competitive in the marketplace with rivals so they don't lose market share. But on the long-term horizon, their only incentive is that healthcare grows as a percentage of GDP. That's their only true incentive. And so we have actually removed them as a major downward player. And it is very different than pharmaceutical companies, um, which are not capped as profit as percent of revenue. And so now you have an unequal ecosystem that will only tend towards expansion, much like the universe itself. Oh, here was one. Men should limit alcohol to one drink a day, experts say. And I said, and we wonder why public trust in science is eroded. That doesn't need much explanation. I think it's pretty, pretty true. All right, that's all I got for this week's monologue. We're going to turn to our discussion about Sprint Trial with Mark Friedberg. I'm back in plenary session, end of day's bunker, and I'm joined via Zoom with uh, Dr. Mark Friedberg. Mark Friedberg now is a senior vice president of performance measurement and improvement at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Prior to that, he had a distinguished career for the Rand Corporation, and he's a, by training, general internist and health policy researcher, and you will see him active on Twitter. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you join us here on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, you and I have been meaning to do this for quite a while, but we haven't had a chance to sit down and talk about it. But there's one thing in this wide world of uh, evidence-based medicine that you and I agree on wholeheartedly, and that has to do with a clinical trial called SPRINT. So why don't I just toss it to you, and maybe let's just start by saying, you know, what is the SPRINT trial? Why do so many people care about it, and why do we hear about it? You know, it seems like not a month goes by without somebody bringing it up. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so the the SPRINT trial was um, a widely publicized trial of blood pressure control. And it was actually stopped early and got a fair amount of press even before um, the initial publication in the New Mm England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, guidelines have been rewritten, um, in part at least, um, Mm -hmm. based on this trial. Mm -hmm. And those are now filtering over to my area, which is uh, performance measurement, where we have um, guidelines and blood pressure targets also being changed uh, based at least in part, on this landmark trial. I see. And Sprint, unlike um, prior studies, um, you know, for years we knew blood pressure is important. We had a number of clinical trials that show, you know, you should shoot for generally less than 140 over 80. Um, But Sprint was unique as in in that it was the first positive trial um, that shot for something that was, you know, even lower than that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's right. And that's, I think, why this made such a big splash. I mean, when I was training, um, you know, in, in general, you know, internal medicine, primary care, uh, we were taught and there were, a, you know, there were many studies to back this up that we should generally be aiming for a blood pressure target of uh, 140 over 90 or less. Yeah. And you didn't have to go crazy um, below that number. Um, yeah. You know, that was sort of the flat part of the curve as far as we knew for the outcomes we cared about, you know, cardiovascular um Outcomes, generally speaking, heart at heart attack, strokes, overall mortality, all that stuff. Um, you know, you got you know the the big um, mortality and other benefit uh, um, from blood pressure control when you're you know lowering someone who's like wildly out of control down to sort of semi in control. And once you got below 140 over 90, there really wasn't much evidence at all that additional blood pressure lowering would do anything good for your patients. And of course, you start to run into some side effects below those things like. Um, you know, you might have patients who get a little lightheaded, especially among the elderly, um, as that diastolic blood pressure really starts to drop in some cases, or they're on multiple um, 
antihypertensive medications, you know, you can have falls and, and other things can happen. So yeah. generally speaking, if someone came to your office and was sort of happy at 120 over 80, um, didn't seem to have any dizziness or other side effects, there was really no reason in the world to mess with the medications. You of just course. said, hey, good of job, course. keep doing yeah. what you're doing. Right. So, so I guess, I mean, just to sort of hit those key points, like what you're saying is that, you know, for many years, the standard training was, you know, shoot to get somebody's systolic blood pressure less than 140. But, you know, if you put somebody on a little bit of lisinopril and maybe some amlodipine and they happen to be at 120 over 80, uh, 120 over 85, something like that, and they feel fine, 125 over 85, you're not going to rock the boat. You're just going to let them be. Uh, but, you know, you're not shooting for that stringent a target. You were just shooting for less than 140 and you happen to get a little bit lucky. So be it. That's right. Yeah, I think there was just a lot of good common sense being applied to that general idea. Uh, when you change medications, all kinds of bad things can happen. You know, people can get confused. Um, mm -hmm. Pharmacies can get confused. The pill um, shape and color might change. You know that can actually lead to adherence, as Aaron Kesselheim and colleagues have shown. Yeah, uh, it's really better not to rock the boat unless you have a very good reason, especially among patients who might be you know, taking you know multiple multiple medications, might have other comorbidities. You, know, you really just want to keep things fairly steady as, as as best you can. Right. So, you know, Sprint came along and, you know, all of a sudden people are saying, well, you know, that's not good enough. Um, maybe we should be aiming for a lower blood pressure target, you yeah. know, systolic blood pressure of less than 120. And that, yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. There's a lot of my patients and many, many patients out there who are cruising around um, between 120 and 140. And before that was published, we would have just been, you know, fine with those systolic blood pressures. Yeah. Um, and, and Sprint comes along. And it's a randomized control trial that's shooting for a target less than 140 or a target less than 120. Uh, they didn't quite achieve that in the uh, in the in the stringent group. You know, the the median blood pressure achieved was you know just just above 120. But they, nevertheless, they were shooting for lower than 120. Um, uh, in the control group, they they sort of get to a median achieved blood pressure of about 135 ish or something like that in the clinical study. And I think the, the, sh the sort of sh shocking finding in Sprint was not only is there an improvement in the primary outcome, you know, one of these classic cardiovascular composite outcomes, but also an improvement in death from all cause. So, you know, at first glance, Sprint looks positive, you know, mortality benefit. If you, if you shot for a stringent target, less than 120, um, if you really drove that blood pressure low, um, you know, so a lot of people, I think, um, conclude that this is a practice changing trial. Um, but you and I uh, have always gravitated to something about Sprint that has troubled us. Is that fair to say? Uh, that's fair to say. And, you know, there have been various criticisms of Sprint. You know, you hear in the study, for example, blood pressure was measured in a way that doesn't really affect, you know, standard practice in the United States. And th those are all, you know, valid uh, concerns. But that's not the one that really stopped me uh, cold when I was yeah. thinking about this trial. Yeah, same. And and it's interesting, actually. You can you can be a fairly careful reader of the literature and gloss right over this feature of the of the trial that's, yeah. uh, that's you know, deeply problematic from my perspective. Yeah. And um, so you ready? Ready yeah, for the big reveal? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. The, 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 the thing right. of Sprint, the invalidating characteristic, in my opinion. Right. So, so here it is. It's the comparison arm. It's the standard, um, what they call uh, standard treatment. That's the actual uh, nomenclature used in this study. And I've been cautioned on Twitter to you know, not try to relabel it. So I'm just going to call it exactly what the authors call it, which is standard treatment. standard treatment. And in the abstract of the main paper, New England Journal of Medicine 2015, I'm just going to read it. I've got it up on my computer right now. It says, we randomly assigned 9,061 persons with a systolic fresh, uh, blood pressure of 130 millimeters of mercury or higher and an increased cardiovascular risk, but without diabetes, to a systolic blood pressure target of less than 120 millimeters of mercury, that's mm -hmm. the intensive treatment arm, so the active treatment arm, or a target of less than 140 millimeters of mercury, parentheses, standard treatment. Mm -hmm. So that standard treatment arm, if you only read the abstract, sounds just like what we earlier discussed, uh, what we were discussing earlier. Yes. Um, that, um, you know, that, was, that really was standard of care in primary care, generally speaking. But that's not actually what they did. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's actually deeply misleading in the abstract. Yeah. And that misleading um, statement is actually in every sprint uh, uh, trial <laughs> right. and spinoff trial that right. I've seen to date. Right. And yeah. in fact, um, even in the main manuscripts of some of these spinoff trials, they don't tell you what's really going on. So right. here's what's actually going on. And the only reason I found out about this one I did was because Larry Huston tweeted about yes. it. Yes, yes. He's he the first to clipped, see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the... 
you know, I, I, I love Twitter for many reasons, but but one of them is is finding experts like like him, uh, who who point out aspects of articles that you know you'd have to really spend a lot of time reading the liter- literature um, uh, to get on your own. So so here's the, here's the snip uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine original paper in 2015 uh, from the methods section. It's only one sentence. Um, but but it says something very different from what the abstract says. Mm-hmm. It says, for participants in the standard treatment group, medications were adjusted to target systolic blood pressure of 135 to 139 millimeters of mercury. Mm-hmm. And the dose was reduced if systolic blood pressure was less than 130 millimeters of mercury on a single visit or less than 130 millimeters of mercury on two consecutive visits. Mm-hmm. So just, just to say that well, again, what this means is, if somebody comes to your clinic and is 120 or over 80, like I would have considered to be totally normal, and I think almost every PCP in, in the world would have considered to be totally normal prior to this um, study, this standard treatment arm says, no, that's not, that's not okay. You can't just let that person hang out at 120 over 80 mm-hmm. because that's less than 130 millimeters of mercury systolic. Yes. You, at that visit, have to dial back the antihypertensive medication. Yep. Or... If they're at 132 on two consecutive visits, you also have to dial back their antihypertensive medication. And of course, if they ever, ever, ever go over 139, so they're 140 or above, then you have to dial it back up. Mm-hmm. So for one thing, we measure blood pressure with me- error. We know this. Um, yes. They probably measured it with a little less error in this study, yeah. but in active practice, we measure it with error. But you, know, you can never get rid of all the error. Blood pressure is naturally going to fluctuate a little bit throughout the day and uh, you know, throughout, throughout your life. Um, but this is just totally different from standard practice because it's going to mean a lot more medication changes. Yes. I mean, you can imagine all the problems that might happen with this and why no one was doing this before this trial, Standard Arm, uh, came out. Yes, and I guess I'd say just to, to further these points is, you know, what you're saying is that um, standard practice was you're shooting for less than 140 systolic, so be it. But if you happen to get a patient, let's just let's take it to the extreme, 129 over 85. 129 over 85, you wouldn't have touched it at all. You would have just stayed the course. But according to this protocol, because that single systolic reading was less than uh, 130, 129 over 85, you have to dose reduce this patient on that visit. You're not allowed to let him ride. And and that turned out to affect a non-trivial percentage of patients. 87% of participants had at least one dose reduction, and 7.5% of participants in the standard arm had complete withdrawal of medication for hypertension, as if they're cured of their hypertension. So this non-standard maneuver really affected a lot of people in this clinical study. And that has implications, I think, for the study. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um I think the reason no one, you know, in their right mind was doing this kind of blood pressure management, you know, out in the, out in nature, out in sight of this kind of a study, was that just on its face it seems quite harmful. Yes, you're going to be taking people who are, you know, well controlled, but not low and not having any symptoms off their blood pressure medication entirely in some cases, or having it reduced in others, and some of them might, you know, have some kind of rebound, and that can cause, you know, bad events. They might just get confused about their medication, stop taking other ones. You never know what's going to happen when you start changing medications. You just don't need to be changing. Yes. And for that reason, I think it's highly likely that the standard treatment arm is actually inferior and is much more dangerous than you know regular, sane, primary care management of blood pressure prior yeah. to the publication of this study. Yeah. And so what you end up with is there's – now you have to think about three things, not just two. So the study's you know, set up, as many trials are, with just two arms, and one arm looks better than the other. But when you think about applicability to you know, actual clinical practice that doesn't resemble either arm, you've lost transitivity. What I mean by that is one arm of the study is, in my mind, plausibly worse than standard care. And yeah. that happens to be the arm that also lost to the arm. So I don't know whether relative to the standard care that I, that I still practice, which is just to you know, look at one, 140 over 90 and, and you know, call it a day, um, whether the standard treatment arm was equivalent, was was better than, or was worse than um, what I actually do. And for that reason, I can't interpret the effect. Um, it's certainly possible that the active treatment arm of Sprint is no better than what I do in my normal care, but the entire difference between standard treatment and active treatment in the uh, Sprint trial is due to just 
harm caused by the standard treatment protocol. Yeah, this non-standard thing. And I think that's the thing that, you know, really sticks with me is you can imagine a clinical study and in one arm of the clinical study, it could be standard treatment according to Sprint. And in the other arm of clinical study, it could have been what Mark Friedberg was doing for decades as a primary care doctor, right? This can be two arms of the study. And in well, one, one decade. Ar- well, only one decade. <laughs> I won't give you any extra decades. I okay. don't have decades yet. Right. One decade. Okay. One decade. Okay. So, so in one arm, the Sprint control arm, the standard treatment arm, you're going to hit a median systolic blood pressure achieved of 136, which is about what they achieved in the study. It's going to look just like the control arm of this trial. But 87% of participants are going to get dose reduced. 7.5% of participants are going to get pulled off medication. In the other arm, you're probably, by chance alone, and certainly, you're going to achieve a median systolic blood pressure of maybe 133, 134, something like that. Um, maybe 132, you know, something in that range. It's going to be less than 136, but it's unlikely to be lower than 120. Absolutely not that case, right? So that's not what we were doing before. So you're going to get 136. And if you could show sort of a distribution um, in one one case, you'd get sort of a smooth sort of bell-shaped distribution. This is what Mark Friedberg was doing, you know, centered on 134. Some people happen to be lower. Some people happen to be higher and probably a little bit of a cliff when you get over 140 because, you know, you were shooting for less than that. In the control, in, yeah, the sprint, sure. in the sprint arm, you're going to get sort of a, a, um, a, a distribution where the center is 136, and then there's a cliff on one side at 135-ish, because if you have two consecutive readings less than 135, you've got to dose reduce them, and there's going to be a cliff on the other side at about 140-ish, and you're really going to be kind of jamming people into this very tight range. And I think... In addition for sort of all the reasons you've espoused that, you know, you're changing people's medications, you're making all these switches, I think there's also some sort of pharmacologic reasons why the standard therapy arm of Sprint will be inferior because you're taking people who are sort of really having their blood pressure lowered well with maybe one or two antihypertensives. And you're, you're penalizing those people who might be, you know, sort of really benefiting from a stroke reduction by making them you know, down titrate the medication that's giving them a benefit. And, and, and for both those reasons, I think because of the switches and because you're probably penalizing these naturally good responders who get to 133, um, you know, which isn't even a great response, but, you know, by this trial, it would penalize them. Um, I think for those two reasons, it is entirely possible that what Mark was doing in his clinical practice for a decade has a superior overall survival than this control arm of this study. Yeah, that's exactly it. There, yeah, I think you, you nailed it. There's, there's two plausible pathways to harm here. There's one directly mediated through the blood pressure um, control. And exactly as you say, in that standard treatment arm, we've sort of eliminated um, a bunch of possible systolic blood pressures between, you know, 20 and 135. Yeah. Um, but there's also the, you know, around the blood pressure. There's the, the, the stuff that doesn't have to do with blood pressure that's just a consequence of changing people's medications all the time. Yes. And doing it, you know, in a, in a completely unnecessary way. That that on its own um, is plausibly harmful. Now, I need to be really careful here and say that, do I know for Correct. sure yeah. that the standard treatment arm of Sprint is more harmful than what I and No, that no one's actually ever done a randomized study of normal, real-world primary care management of blood pressure. Yeah, versus and this control the Sprint, arm. Standard yeah. treatment arm. Yeah. But uh, now, now the last thing I want you to touch on is, um, you know, one of the common responses you get when you toss this out, which is that, look, um, I don't know, but it is entirely plausible sprint control arm is worse than what we were doing. You know, that's that's the contention here. And I think that's, you know, on the face of it, that's true. Um, but one of the responses you get back is, this is the way we do all studies like this. This is the way we did a cord. This is the way we do every study where you shoot for one target versus the other target. And you want to push back on that and say, no, it's not exactly the way we do other studies. So why is that? Yeah, yeah. So so this uh, another thing I learned from Twitter was uh, that this study uh, control arm uh, was was taken from a cord, and you know, and 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 they even say that in the um, sprint uh, protocol document, they say that it was you know the, the standard treatment arm is based on a cord, yes. which which you might interpret as being identical to a cord. Correct. Yeah. Um, it turns out that's not quite right. Yeah. Um, so a cord did you know sort of generally speaking have these two systolic blood pressure targets where they're um, in in the standard treatment arm trying to keep the systolic blood pressure above 130 or 135 at two consecutive visits. But there's one really critical distinction. In sprint, if people obeyed the protocol, and you know if they didn't, then you know we can just sort of ignore the entire study because we don't know what happened. Right. Um, but if uh, 
if people obeyed the protocol in Sprint, there was no room for judgment. Yes. You just flat out down titrated those blood pressure medications. Whether you liked it or blood not. Blood pressure yep. was in the 120s. Yep. Whether you liked it or not, whether the patient had symptoms or not. In Accord, that was not the case. So I'll read um, the uh, the actual language from the Accord protocol, which I you know read after after um, being um, this you know, relationship between studies. Um, down titration or step down of therapy in the standard group is allowed at the discretion of the Accord therapist. Yes, that's a big after difference. consultation yep. with the participant. Yeah, that's the patient. If the SBP less than 130 millimeters at a you know single visit or 135 millimeters of mercury at two consecutive visits, so so the key distinction here is mandatory step down versus allowed, but only if the Accord therapist, the doctor, sort of thinks of it, and only that's a critical distinction yeah, between only, the two. Only if the doctor thought of it, and only if the patient agreed to it, and 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 the things that are going to weigh into that decision are: is the patient symptomatic? Is the patient feeling fine? Does the patient yeah. want to rock the boat or not? And most people don't want to rock the exactly. boat. They're probably going to stick with it. Yes, that's exactly right. But there's one other thing: even if the Accord um, standard treatment arm were exactly like Sprint, with no room for discretion. Yes. Well, in Accord, the standard treatment arm. Um, one, it was actually better right, right, uh, than, right. than the other arm. Right. And there you actually have transitivity, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I, I don't think the Accord arm is better than how I practice. Yeah. And yet it beat this more um, intensive blood pressure approach. So, of course, I'm not going to do the more intensive approach when it was beat by the thing that's actually inferior, in my view, to what I do. Right. Okay. Well put. Yeah, you're right. In that case, it's a negative study, so it's kind of a moot point. It's not going to change what you're already doing, and in fact, uh, it, it's probably less stringent than what you're already doing. So, you know, for these reasons, I think um, uh, the, the bottom line of Sprint the reason why it's a hundred million dollar kind of honest waste of money. It's a waste of money because the control arm does not resemble what we are actually what we're actually doing in clinical practice. And and as long as the control arm doesn't resemble what we're doing in clinical practice and is plausibly inferior to what we're doing in clinical practice, the trial cannot be used to change what we're doing to the, the intervention arm of Sprint. And so it was a lot of money, a lot of time, a well-done study, but unfortunately had a fatal flaw that makes it completely, I think, irrelevant um, and need of replication if it's going to be used to change practice. What do you think? Yeah, at a minimum, we need, you know, what some people call super sprint. So we got to repeat what we did here, yeah. but with a third arm, which is normal care. Normal 140 care. 140 over 90, don't mess um, with uh, the 120 over 80 if everybody's happy and tooling along. Absolutely. So I know you got to run, Mark, but I think um, I think this is a public service because we have seen over and over again, Sprint um, has been sort of hailed as practice changing. Um, the key um, sort of problem, I think, first brought to attention by, by Larry Houston on Twitter. Um, and then, of course, the legendary Mark Pfeiffer uh, pushed this issue really hard in a letter to the editor. He, he was able to get the Sprint investigators to tell us how often they dose reduce patients. And the answer was 87% of participants. So in other words, it clearly um, was frequent enough to have played potentially a role. And for those reasons, I think Sprint is probably uh, the single most oversold study of the last 10 years. I'm willing to take that heat for saying that. It's the single most oversold study, in part because they press released it months before they had the article, and in part because it has this fatal flaw buried in it that you really have to be uh, an investigative journalist, as it took in this case, to find it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, to this day, um, you know, even, even within the last month, the uh, papers misrepresenting that sprint control arm uh, that uh, uh, are published in the JAMA journals, for example. Yeah. Um, th you know, it, it takes three more characters in an abstract, to be honest, about the design of the systolic target in the standard treatment arm. It's not 140. It's 135 to 140. If they just yeah. add 135 dash, they've got it. <laughs> well, but of course, that would yeah. take away the applicability because everyone would instantly see yes. that it doesn't apply to their practice. Yes. And I think that the real takeaway lesson beyond Sprint is that, you know, every time I read a randomized control trial, whether it's Sprint or another trial that I massacred on this podcast, which is Polo, the first thing you have to ask is, is the control arm what I'm doing? And if the control arm doesn't resemble what you're doing and is potentially or plausibly worse than what you're doing, then I don't even think you need to read the trial because it's not relevant to you. It doesn't change you from what you're doing to whatever they're doing in their intervention arm. That's right. Yeah, maybe if anything, like Sprint, you know, just says don't do the control arm, which right. I already wasn't doing. Which I already wasn't and doing. It, and I would actually be very concerned about any doctor who, who was doing that control arm for our, you know, uh, uh, general decision making. Well, we can look forward to the fact that this podcast segment is likely to generate 
criticism on Twitter. So I look forward to that, Mark. I'll see you there for a few more rounds in the, in, the, in the arena discussing Sprint. Very good. Thanks for doing it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Season 3 of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.